And again, I'd like to welcome everybody to the program. This is our 91st program of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. And on a snowy winter solstice day, we are fittingly talking about snowmobiling in Minnesota, kind of the, the birthplace of snowmobiling, kind of. So I'd like to welcome Wade Miller, our state trail and state snowmobile program consultant to the program. And Wade, I'll let you take it away and introduce yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Sounds great. Sweet. Uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, thank you for asking me to participate in this Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series and to share a little bit about snowmobiling in Minnesota. Um, I am the State Trail and Snowmobile Program Consultant. I've been in this position uh, for the DNR Division of Parks and Trails since September. So I'm still learning, but I'm not new to snowmobiling. Um, I've been a snowmobiler my whole life and beyond. Um, and uh, I just want to share uh, some information to folks that don't know much about snowmobiling and reinforce information that folks uh, that have been around the snowmobiling program a while, uh, where, are, where are some tools and resources and, and some reminders. And so with, uh, with that said, we'll move right in and in this uh, presentation, we're kind of going to talk about how to get started in snowmobiling, what you need to know to try this wintertime activity. We'll go through some history and background of snowmobiling, economic impact, and then really the meat and potatoes of what is needed, when, where, and how. Uh, training and requirements and tools and resources. And then, of course, like any activity or sport, there's etiquette. And so we'll talk about a few of these things. And then uh, ideally, we'll, we'll have an opportunity at the end for some robust question and answer. So thank you very much. The history. So the snowmobile was invented in 1922. So this is the 100th snowmobile season anniversary since it was invented by Joseph Armand Bombardier or Bombardier, Bombardier depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, like most inventions that typically come from necessity, there was a need to get people in and out of remote areas. Uh, they typically were country doctors, ambulance drivers, and faith leaders. Uh, Joseph Bombardier actually lost a, a son because he couldn't get him to the hospital in time. So that was the motivation I think he had to develop the official, by definition, snowmobile, a vehicle that could cross snow um, and steered by skis. Um, at one time, there was approximately... 250 snowmobile brands, um, and two of those, three three at one time were in Minnesota, um, Scorpion, of course, but two still are here today. And uh, they're Minnesota-based, Polaris, uh, located out of Roseau, Minnesota, and of course, Articat, out of Thief River, Minnesota, both located in the northern part of Minnesota. So absolutely, uh, Minnesota is steeped with a history in snowmobiling from manufacturing and recreation. Some background. In 1973, the Minnesota legislature delegated the responsibility of administering a cost sharing program for the development and maintenance of snowmobile trails to the Department of Natural Resources and ultimately the Parks and Trails Division. And the Parks and Trails Division developed the Minnesota Trails Assistance Program, commonly known as Grant and Aid or GIA. Uh, the goal of the program was to initiate locally developed trails and provide funding assistance for maintenance and grooming. And the reason it was locally developed is when snowmobiling became from necessity and need to more of a recreation, folks that started to get involved in it and acquire snowmobiles wanted to connect with cities and gas, and then they wanted to connect socially with neighbors and started to develop very informal trails networks and then statewide uh, ended up connecting all of the trails, most of the trails um, to one another. So it'd be very hard not to go from any corner of the state to the opposite corner of the state, um, not on a snowmobile. They're all pretty much connected in one way or another. Today, Minnesota has over 22,000 miles of groomed trails there are approximately 220,000 registered snowmobiles. Of those more than 22,000 miles of groomed trails, um, 21,000 
more than 21,000 miles, I should say, are main, maintained by local clubs, but 21,000 miles approximately are maintained through the grant and aid or GIA program. There are, there are trails that are not enrolled in the grant and aid program, primarily because the system can't support funding more trails. So clubs have what we call club trails and they're, they're maintained. They walk and talk like grant and aid trails there. Some of them are located on DNR maps and publications and others clubs have their own maps and they put their own connections and trails uh, in their geographical area. And some of the things that the clubs do uh, for, for and with the grant and aid program is they obtain permission from landowners. And landowners can range from private individual uh, landowners to city, county, township, state, DNR, MnDOT, uh, to federal, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, to U.S. Forest Service. And to obtain these permissions, um, they have to uphold the requirements of the landowner. And ultimately, they're securing that permission to have a recreational trail on that, we'll call it, private and or public property. The clubs have to acquire and maintain equipment. Their equipment can range from chainsaws and, and hand tools, um, side-by-sides with tracks, uh, snowmobiles, ATVs, groomers, and then drags. And some of the groomers are small, you know, six to eight foot wide groomers, and other ones are 10 to 12 foot groomers. Um, and it depends on the conditions of the trail, what sort of equipment they'll be able to use at the right time of year. And they have to maintain all that equipment and infrastructure as well. Community involvement is very important as they assist with local events and fundraising events to help support the cost of maintaining these public trails and, and the equipment that involved in maintaining them. And then ultimately they, they maintain the trails and they do that mowing, brushing, signing, fencing, packing swamps, bridge and culvert installation and repairs, and then ultimately grooming. And grooming is the actual term given to a piece of equipment, modifying and manipulating the snow, and then turning it into a well-packed, smooth riding trail. That's, a, that's the actual term given to the grooming part of it. But there's a lot more that goes into these snowmobile trails than just grooming and making them smooth and we're seeing it today um, with the recent snow events we've had and again today we're having another event uh, clubs and DNR staff are out cutting branches cutting trees trying to open up the trails and uh, make them usable we have enough snow now uh, the economic impact Minnesota estimates about one billion dollars each year from snowmobiling and snowmobilers commonly need these things. They need gas, they need to sleep, they need to eat, and socialization. They wanna be with other people, they wanna be with their families. Um, it's a great social uh, and almost a family-oriented sport. Snowmobiling in Minnesota, getting started. What is needed to ride snowmobile in Minnesota? Training. Certification is required for residents born after December 31st, 1976. So basically anybody under 46 years old needs to have certification training. Youth ages 11 to 15, there are two options. There's the traditional classroom based or online training. Both options do require a field day and a writing performance course. If you're 11, the certification does not become valid until you're age 12. And then for clarification purposes, because this is not always easy to understand, um, this is page 18 of the snowmobile regulations booklet. And just getting into the residents and non-residents under the age of 12 category on page 12, just to clarify a couple things. If you're under the age of 12 without a safety certificate, you may drive a snowmobile on public lands, public waters, or grant and aid trails if accompanied by an adult. You may not drive a snowmobile across state or county roads. You may not drive snowmobiles on streets or highways in a municipality. Ages 12 and 13 may drive a snowmobile on public lands, public waters, or grant and aid trails if accompanied by an adult or in possession of a valid snowmobile safety certificate. They may not drive a snowmobile across state or county roads. 
They may not drive snowmobiles on streets or highways in a municipality. And folks, a very common question they have is, well, if I'm riding, how do I get my child or my nephew across the road? He's a very accomplished, but legally he can't cross a public road at the age of 12 and 13. Well, the work around it is that you as the adult would run the snowmobile across for the youth. So ages 12 to 13. Um, and then they can ride on the snowmobile again once they've crossed that county or state road. Ages 14 to 18, they may drive a snowmobile across state and county forest roads, excuse me, state and county roads if in possession of a snowmobile safety certificate or driver's license or ID card with valid snowmobile indicator. They may drive a snowmobile on public lands, public waters, or grant made trails with a snowmobile safety certificate. And they may drive a snowmobile on streets or highways in municipalities if not prohibited by a local ordinance. And then of course, over the age of 18, residents born after December 31st, 1976, must possess a valid snowmobile safety certificate or a driver's license or ID card with valid snowmobile indicator. So typically when you have completed your online training, it goes into the system. And so when you get a new driver's license and you have that certificate, it can be incorporated onto your driver's license. And so when you go to the DMV to update your driver's license, um, many folks may have firearm certificates and they may have endorsements, um, snowmobile or excuse me, motorcycle endorsement and the snowmobile would be the same thing. It would be in your card or on your card. And when I say in your card, it may not show up on the new enhanced driver's license, but it is in the system if they scan your driver's license. And accompanied by an adult means a parent, legal guardian, or other person 18 years of age or older designated by the parent or guardian who needs to be close enough to be able to direct the use operation of their snowmobile. And then uh, just an exception for residents and non-residents without a snowmobile safety certificate, a person under the age of 14 may operate a snowmobile only if they are supervised or accompanied by the following. A parent, legal guardian, or other person 18 years of age or older, designated by the parent or guardian, supervising or accompanying adult needs to be close enough to be able to direct the youth's operation of their snowmobile. This exception does not allow the operator under age of 18 to cross public roads. Non-residents who are 18 years and older do not need a snowmobile safety certificate. It's a very common question we get and uh, in the link and in the chat um, is the regulations booklet that I just pulled that page out of. And then another link to the snowmobile safety training. It Click on the buttons, it navigates you right to where and how you need to become certified to operate a snowmobile in the state of Minnesota. Snowmobiling in Minnesota, what is needed? Items needed, number one, a partner. Don't snowmobile alone, especially in remote areas. It's cold and, and if you live in Minnesota, you know what our winters can be like and you can't always trust that your machine or the conditions are gonna get you from A to B safely. So a partner can provide you with a backup ride if needed, um, they can obtain help and they definitely can help you get uh, unstuck if that happens. A snowmobile, to try this sport out, you do need a snowmobile one way or another. You can buy one, which is very costly. You can rent them to try it before you buy it. Or of course you can ride as a passenger with someone that may already have a snowmobile or you rent a, a passenger sled and two people um, for the price of one get to experience snowmobiling. Of course, you should always have a helmet. A helmet is not required ironically, but everybody wears one um, to keep their, their head warm, but it's very important if you do buy a helmet or if you're borrowing a helmet, make sure the helmet is comfortable and, comfortable and fits correctly. If your helmet is too loose, it can cause visibility issues when you're riding a trail or hit bumps. Um, and if it's too tight, you can get a headache and it leads to exhaustion and irritability. And of course, you don't have as much fun. Rental places typically provide helmets for folks. And then of course, 
gloves, boots, snowsuit, and jacket. Items can be purchased or borrowed. So if you are new to the sport of snowmobiling and you want to get started, um, I'll have some more information here, but you can do it without spending much, if any, money at all. Of course, you probably need to commit to, to paying for some gas until they come out with electric snowmobiles. Snowmobiling in Minnesota, where to go? Where can I ride? Where should I ride? DNR has an interactive map and it shows all the grant aid trails and some club trails uh, that are all groomed trails. And when you click on the interactive map link, which is located here, it brings you to a map and you can go throughout the entire state and zoom in, pan around. If you wanna pick a destination, you wanna ride uh, Northeast, Southwest, Central Minnesota, uh, pan into where you live, where you want to go, where you want to try and ride. And if you zoom in and you click on a trail, it pops you up who the contact is. So to the right here, you see Snowmobile Trail 114. It's Merrifield Marathon's trails. The contact person is Rodney Scorich. He's a volunteer club person who is signed up in part of the Grant Nate program to have his name and information publicized and he's a public contact. So feel free to reach out to to any of these public contacts because they're going to be the most intimate with the trails that they manage and maintain. If you want to know what, you know, if you have a, a short trip planned and, you know, if a club has 60 miles and you can only ride 20 or 30, hey, what portions of trail would you recommend would be the most scenic for your, your system? Um, they're going to tell you, they're going to tell you their grooming schedule. They're going to tell you what they've done. They're going to tell you, um, even if they have club rides, they're going to be very, very, uh, able to answer any of your questions about their trail that they manage and maintain. Uh, Min USA is the Minnesota United Snowmobile Association. There are statewide advocacy group that supports and champions the sport of snowmobiling statewide. There are members. Uh, individual members, and then there are clubs that are involved in Min USA. And Min USA is a great partner with the Minnesota DNR to help inform us and work together closely to ensure that snowmobiling is here to stay. It's appropriately funded, and if there are changes made, we work together to get those changes completed. If you click on the Min USA link that's going to be included in this presentation, there are a lot of resources there. You can contact clubs. Um, they're, they're listed by counties. Um, you can look at uh, anything from conditions. Uh, when you, cl you click around enough, of course, you can, you can find out recent conditions. You know, these clubs keep very, very uh, tight reins on their program, meaning that if they, if they have improvements, if they've been groom grooming, they're gonna have that stuff pretty live. And you're gonna be able to get into those links to individual clubs to see their their status and their updates and their conditions. Contact clubs. Uh, many clubs have guided rides and look forward to new riders. And so you reach out to a club member and you say, say, I, I don't know if I want to get into snowmobiling. Um, do you or do you know of someone um, that can maybe hold my hand? Uh, I'm willing to rent one. Um, is there someone that has a two up where I could just experience a snowmobile? Um, these clubs are very resourceful and they're going to help out. They want they want more people in their sport, like a lot of folks, and they'll do what they can to help you out and assist you. Snowmobiling in Minnesota, when to go? The season dates for snowmobiling are December 1st through April 1st each year. There may not be rideable snow on December 1st um, and certainly may not be groomed, but the season dates specifically apply to the grant and aid trails, especially where the clubs have obtained landowner permission. Gates don't go, don't get opened until December 1st, and then they typically close April 1st um, to protect the resource and protect their, their relationship with their landowners. Uh, on state lands, you can operate a snowmobile on state forest lands, uh, many state trails, unless prohibited. Um, you can ride a snowmobile year round on a, a state trail. Uh, it, there's no season on it per se, but you'll want to have some sort of snow component. You're not going to want to ride snowmobile on bare asphalt or gravel, but it is open beyond December 1st and April 1st if there's sufficient snow. And in the Northeast, 
Uh, they typically get the largest portion of, of snow in the state and their season starts early and lasts a lot longer than most parts of the state. Trail conditions, check for snow reports. The DNR has a, a website and the link will be included in this as well uh, to groomed trail conditions. And I'll just run through these real briefly that kind of the expectations that you would see if you saw a location you were interested in riding or a trail or a state park, uh, you'd see red is closed, it's not open. Poor means it's it's open, you can go there, but there may not be a lot of snow or there may be a lot of bare spots, but you could you could ride your sled. Fair typically means that the trails have been probably groomed. There's a need for new snow. Um, when snow gets um, when snow gets cold and it gets used a lot, it turns into kind of a sugar sand and powder. And so fresh snow is needed or maybe a little bit of warmth um, to help harden that. So grooming uh, can really pack that snow down. So fair means that, you know, the trails are rideable. There's probably snow covered on all the trails. There's probably a, a two to four inch base on the trails. And uh, it may be a little bit bumpy because of lack of snow. And then good, of course, is you probably have a, anywhere from three to six inch base of snow. It's recently been groomed or there's been recent snow um, and there shouldn't be blown out corners or there shouldn't be bare spots at all on the trail. And and all the, the trees and signage are in good condition. And of course, very good to excellent um, is the best time to go. And that means that there is ample snow anywhere you wanna go. Typically, it means the lakes are even frozen. You can get across lakes without a problem. The trails have been recently groomed and they're in excellent condition. We've gotten timely snow. So typically a, a club will groom one to two days a week, a portion of trail, depending on the use that, that trail gets. And so right after a grooming, the conditions are typically excellent. And then depending on the use it receives, they may drop down to very good to good. The DNR reports on this website every Thursday on the snowmobile conditions. However, snowmobile clubs report daily on their conditions. So if they groom on a Thursday, um, they're gonna report that either on that Thursday or that Friday. And if they groom again on Monday or Tuesday, they'll report it as soon as they groom. Where the DNR typically just reports once a week to give a, a general um, idea of the conditions in that area. The diagram on the right shows, and it's part of the snowmobile trail conditions too, it shows the snowfall and as of December 15th, uh, you can see that the north shore of Minnesota has received, you know, more than 30 inches of snow. And then, um, you know, the southwest portion of the state has received hardly any or very little. And uh, so you can you can look at the, the map and say, oh, this is this is how much snow these areas of the state have gotten. Um, how do I plan my trip and where do I want to ride or what conditions would probably be the best um, for snowmobiling? Snowmobiling in Minnesota, how to go. Trail etiquette. Like any sport, there's always etiquette involved. Um, you know, a few things to keep in mind is keep to the right of a trail. Operate in a safe and courteous manner. The statewide speed limit on, is, on snowmobile is 50 miles per hour or the posted speed, whichever is lower, except for those ice miles across lakes greater than 10,000 acres where the trail is groomed and marked. The speed limit there is 65 miles an hour. But because we, we wanna keep this simple, just remember 50 mile an hour is the maximum speed statewide. Uh, give trail groomers the right of way. They're the ones maintaining your trail. They're big, um, yield to them when they're out and about. Uh, let, them, let them do their job. Uh, reduce your speed for oncoming traffic. If you're meeting someone on the trail, uh, slow down just like you would um, if you were doing anything in a tight area. You know, our snowmobile trail width ranges, you know, from eight to 12 feet wide, uh, depending on snow conditions and conditions. And so when you see another snowmobiler, you want to slow down. And then uh, give uphill riders the right of way when you are traveling downhill. It only takes one time for you to stop your snowmobile up a hill and realize that it's not that easy to get it going again without getting stuck. And if 
uh, if you've gotten a snowmobile stuck, it's not following you name it. Um, but it, it does typically create a memory, but it's not that enjoyable. Uh, to the right are some very common hand signals used by users. Uh, if they're turning left, they'll signify to the folks behind them, you know, hey, we're gonna, all going to turn left here. Um, my hand's going straight up. We're going to stop. Another another thing is users will stand up on their on their snowmobiles so they can keep both hands on the steering wheel if they're going to stop, or they're letting someone behind them know that there's something coming up. I'm stopping, but I want to keep both my hands on the handlebar for brake reasons. And then, of course, there's the right turn similar to a bicycle um, or old school driving a vehicle signals. Um, waving your hand up and down is letting folks know behind you that you're slowing down. It's probably a bumpy portion of trail or there's um, an obstacle, but they're letting you know that they're slowing down. Um, and typically, snowmobiles have headlights and taillights, and, and you can you can go off of some of that stuff too, but the hand signals is such a social communication uh, very specific to snowmobiling and very, um, it's like watching the, playing the telephone game. You watch the first snowmobiler in a line do something and then you watch everybody following it. And it's kind of neat that you're, you're seeing that people are paying attention to the person in front of them. They're the guy, they're the leader, do what they do. Um, if they're tapping their head, um, that means there's an oncoming snowmobile and if you are meeting this snowmobiler to the next one that says sleds following, they're they're pointing to the person that they're meeting saying, hey, I got more folks behind me, just so you know. And then if you were the last person in a line, you'll typically raise up your left hand in a fist form saying, hey, this is the end of our group. You shouldn't expect anybody, you know, associated with us, but there could be other users out on the trail as well. So there's this, there's this communication that happens on snowmobile trails, and it's really neat, you know, and, and folks that have Gloves instead of mittens will typically tell you that, hey, there's three riding in our group, but there's two left or there's one left. So you might see someone with five and the next person will hold up four and the next person will hold up three and the next person will hold up two. So um, it's just uh, a social way to communicate with, with trail folks and it, it's super uh, safe communication as well, making sure that everybody stays safe, oncoming users as well as folks in your group. Snowmobiling in Minnesota. Let's ride. Some reminders and resources. Um, again, these will be all in the in the chat. But don't ride alone. And reach out to other snowmobilers to try it out. Snowmobilers are a very approachable group of people. They're very family oriented. There's a brotherhood, just like any sport, um, whether it's skiing or biking or hiking. You find someone with a common background or a common interest or a passion. Um, they're going to help you out, get you started. They're going to show you what you need to know firsthand. You know, ideally in the um, in the snowmobile world, it's expensive to get into. But a lot of folks, once they've tried it, immediately get hooked. It's something you can do in the winter. You know, if you haven't done it, you think, why would I want to ride out in the open uh, in the cold? And on a snowmobile, you really don't get cold. There's hand warmers, there's thumb warmers. Your feet stay warm because typically there's a heat exchanger or engine heat coming from the snowmobile. And snowmobiling can be as interactive as you want it to be. Uh, you, there's helmets that help with, uh, you know, frosting, but then there's helmets that allow you to communicate with other riders too. So um, there's, there's so many aspects of snowmobiling that we wouldn't be able to talk about them uh, probably in a day. And so what I was trying to do today was just provide you a little bit of information to hopefully keep you engaged, let you know how this sport um, started, where it's come and where it's going and how can you get involved and what do you need to know? And there are so many other things that you'll learn once you get going. It just, you gotta take the time to reach out to someone. And uh, you know, I always tell folks, if you hold my hand once, you won't have to touch it again for that thing. But there might be the next thing I might need my hand held. And so um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it go. It looks like uh, there's some polling on the screen. Yeah, we did put a little poll out there. So Wade, great job. Thank you so much for, for joining us today and sharing 
your passion and knowledge about snowmobiling in Minnesota. It's, I've, I'm not a huge snowmobiler, I must admit, but have ridden a few times. Our last snowmobile trip was a couple of years ago. We went up to the UP and snowmobiled around. It was the first time I ever been able to bring my girls with because we rented two up sleds up there and it was a blast. I didn't know what they would think of it, but they just had a, they had a blast riding around and seeing the scenery and, um, you know, got to stop at a couple places and eat some food and, and warm up and ski some, or see some ski areas that they hadn't seen before. So it, it was a great time to, great way to spend an afternoon with the family that was out of the car and just having a lot of fun. So. Great. That sounds exciting. I've never been to UP snowmobiling. I, I have a hard time leaving Minnesota. So. <laughs> yeah, typically I would too, but we were headed up there for other reasons too over New Year's and that was just the place we decided to go. So one of those activities you can really have fun in the winter. Nobody wants to sit in their house all winter. So this is a great way to get outside and, and visit with people and be social and have some fun. So uh, Dale has a question here. Do all clubs generally groom on specific days or is each club on its own independent schedule? Excellent question. And uh, I would say in general, Clubs will groom when they need to groom. So they typically will groom before a weekend and after a weekend. And some days, depending on the trail segment, it might take them two to three days to get through their system. But a lot of times they'll start on a Monday or a Tuesday and hopefully by Thursday have all their trails groomed. And if they groom twice a week, typically it's probably that Wednesday uh, or Thursday. And then again on that Monday or Tuesday. Um, yeah, very excellent question. Yeah, again, these are, and you can stop your presentation if you want, Wade. But sure. These are um, all volunteers that are doing this. So it's it's a great way, you know, if you're in the position to go out and help and volunteer and help groom trails, those clubs are always looking for help, I think. So there are, there have been a few media posts, uh, clubs saying, hey, if you're going to go out riding, throw a chainsaw on your sled and give us a hand. <laughs> uh, after the trails get free of debris, uh, the sooner the groomers get out and, and can make nice packed rideable trails. It looks like I was reading through some of the polling questions here. We have a, a fair amount, not everybody answered, but we had uh, more people were in the zero to four category and how often or how many years they've been snowmobiling. So if more new snowmobilers on than people that have been riding 11 plus years, which is kind of nice to see. So. It's getting to be a, a big sport. Uh, Laura asks, have you been hearing about any types of special events that Stoneville clubs are hosting these days? Uh, there are some events. I, a big event that DNR participates in is the, the Min USA annual rendezvous that's going to be held in February 2023. That's a, that's a big event that the United Snowmobile Association puts together and uh, welcomes members and uh, new members, of course. And they they have a, a banquet and there's guided rides that are put on by the local hosting club, allows folks to go to a different area of the state and ride around. But, you know, individual clubs have a lot of events that they participate in. Some clubs do what's called radar runs where they where they have little races. When I say little races, they have races. Um, <laughs> with regular size snowmobiles and, uh, and, uh, they, they do radar runs, they do grass drags. So they drag race even, you know, on grass, um, they do, a, there's a lot of vintage rides. So depending on what you want to do, uh, reach out, look on the Min USA website. Clubs have events. Um, Min USA website has events as well, but each club is going to either know of their specific clubs events or events probably held in their geographical area. That's great. I got a buddy I graduated high school with that was really into, he restored his dad's, um, it was like a 1972 ski that he had, but he restored that and he goes to vintage rides and just loves doing that and seeing people and get out there and running around and race a little bit. So. One of the big things we did when I lived out west in Colorado, because you know snowmobiles were a big part of our life to get into the backcountry and do stuff out there, but we'd have 
races on the Blue Mesa Reservoir every summer. They would bring them out and they'd water skip on their snowmobiles. So something that doesn't sound real easy, but they would get out there and do that. It was kind of fun to watch. So, Yes. And for any new riders, water skipping is illegal. Um, unless, unless permitted, of course. Um, but yeah. This is in Colorado. I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you, but I'm just reminding new users to the Minnesota snowmobiling that uh, water skipping or trying to take your snowmobile across open water is actually illegal and very, very unsafe. Your skis can catch uh, under the ice and, and it's not worth it. Say, I, I do have one more thing I'd like to share with folks. And uh, yeah. Um, it's called the 1101. And uh, if you ever fall through the ice and, you know, you typically need somewhere between five to seven inches of ice, good clear ice to operate a snowmobile um, on, a, on a public lake. But the 1101 rule, it means you have, once you go through the ice, you have one minute to collect your breath. You have 10 minutes to, to get out of the water. And typically there's a lot of videos that show you how you can, if it's cold enough, you get your arms on the ice and you just leave them on the ice and let it freeze and help you get pulled out of the ice. And so you have 10 minutes to get out of that cold water. And then you have up to an hour to try and get your body temperature warmed up before uh, hypothermia sinks in. So it's just, just a, a tip fact if, if something unfortunate happens to you. Uh, remember one ten one. It's a great thing to remember because noise is a hundred percent safe. So we got to always keep our wits about us, and it goes back to your point of always ride with a partner, right? So you exactly. get help if if need be. So Chuck put a thing in the chat here about he would urge anyone to join a club. There are tons of opportunities for fun, youth training, trail support, grooming, fun club rides, club trips. He said it's very rewarding. So just a little shout out there to all the local clubs. And you know, like you kind of mentioned earlier, we wouldn't have the trails and the support we have for, without the snowmobile community and all these local clubs doing a bulk of that work. So, And yeah, we wouldn't have a program if it wasn't for those folks. They, they started it. Grassroots started the, the whole program. And uh, DNR fortunately was able to help out and, and administer a program, but you know, uh, the clubs do a majority of the trails. Ninety-five percent of the trails are maintained by clubs um, through the through their networks, and uh, you know, generationally, you know, a club member usually stays within a club if they were born into it. Uh, they might be part of three or four clubs, but they usually stay connected with their home club too. Because there's, like I said, there's it's rewarding, and there's a sense of. Uh, uh, a sense of family within the clubs. Yeah, which is great. It's a it's a great way to keep keep in touch with people too over the cold winter months. So, and it maybe way thanks again for being here. If we could say a little more about the clubs are the conduit to the private landowners, and just stressing to people that a lot of these trails are over pri private property, and how important it is that we're good stewards of that, and and respectful and and thankful for the the donation or the opportunity to be on those private lands. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you leave that groomed portion of snowmobile trail, or you leave the marked portion, you go on the opposite outside of a, a sign or a marker, that's trespass. And um, if folks want to see a sport shut down, <clears throat> continue to trespass because landowners don't appreciate it, especially those folks that have, uh, you know, agricultural crops, especially alfalfa, that's very sensitive. Um, when you run a snowmobile across young alfalfa, um, the next year there's a there's a yellow line through that alfalfa. It can it can damage crops. Yeah, it's great. You know, for fishing access, I do a lot of fly fishing and stuff too. And I've seen a couple of fishing accesses closed down because of, you know, people littering and not closing gates or going places where they're not supposed to. I think it's the same in all these communities where we're we're really borrowing and using other people's land that they own. So they have the ability to take that away from us. So it's up to us to be the best stewards we can. Um, you know, if you see something that's broke or fixed or a tree that fell down and hit their fence, maybe offer to stop and help clean that up for them. Um, you know, they're doing us a favor by letting a snowmobile 
across their property and be the best stewards we can for that. So, Absolutely. Christine put a little thing in the chat there about ice picks. I use those for ice fishing all the time, but um, little ice picks that you can wear around your neck, they have little spikes in them you can pull out to help get out of ice should something happen. So thanks for that, Christine. Let's see if I can get back to my q and I don't see any other questions we have in the Q&A right now. So I think with that, thank you everybody for, for taking the poll and, and joining us today. And this was, again, it's one of those outdoor sports that's kind of unique to, I think it's unique to Minnesota. I guess it's not really. There's a lot of upper Midwest states that have snowmobiling. And I remember hearing, don't mean to put you on the spot, Wade, but I remember hearing that's probably when I was a kid in rural Minnesota, that Minnesota is one of the states that has more snowmobile trails than we do state highways to maintain. Is that's, Do you know the facts on that? Is that still true? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I don't uh, state highways by mileage. It, it could be possible. DNR managed or DOT managed roads. It could be. I guess I don't know, but I probably is gonna, I'm going to do some research on it because now I'm kind of curious. I'm googling it right now. I I think that was true when I was a kid. If it was then, it probably still is now, right? Yep. Which is kind of a cool thing. It's probably, probably a, it'll probably take me forever to Google it. But thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope it is winter solstice. It's the shortest day of the year, um, which means get home from work and go out with your headlamp and have some fun. Get out fishing, get out snowmobiling. We are expecting some good snow today. So even down in the southeastern or southwestern part of the state, they're probably getting some good trail coverage going on today which is is nice so and this is probably one of the earlier years that snowmobile has been open statewide for the last few at least so i get a lot of comments about thank you so much happy riding happy winter so thanks everybody uh join us next week we will be talking about winter sturgeon fishing next week so should be a good one so hope everybody has a happy holidays and hope and safe be safe out there uh, traveling around hopefully you don't have to travel far today and uh, we'll see everybody next week thanks again